Welcome to the realm of magic and mystery, classic horror and sci-fi. You are entering the House of the Unusual podcast with your hosts, Eddie and Chuck. Hello again for another week of House of the Unusual podcast with Eddie, your host, and Chuck Caputo. And this week we have Sherry as well. Guys, uh, to bring you up to date of a few of the things uh, happening is... um, I have been for the last couple of days, actually weeks, preparing for Chilla Theater, which is going to be in April 26, 27, and 28th of this year. It's going to be the first actual convention I've ever done in my life. Uh, so I'm looking forward for it, but at the same time, I'm a little concerned of all the stuff you got to carry and, you know, things like that. But anyway... Uh, I'm definitely going to do it. They've been asking me to do it for quite some time. Kevin Clements has been asking me that I should have a table there for the longest time. So finally, I caved in. My brother is flying up from Florida to help me. So I'm going to be there. I'm going to bring the bets ball, the, the you know the one I have uh, acquired in Florida, which could be the original. Um, I also will be bringing the book. Some of the books are going to be in the table for sale. Others, I, I would tell people to just buy them directly from Amazon. Um, but anyway, the book is going to be there, and so is the ball. It's going to be displayed. And one of the greatest things I also want to bring up to today is that tonight or maybe later this week, for the first time ever, now, everybody knows and has heard my story of, of looking for the seven-foot robot plants that were advertised in comic books by the Melton Company. And also Guarantee Company, which was the same company from 1970. But I have been looking for them for close to 45 years, I would say. And everywhere I've gone, I've hit a wall. I've had collectors all over the country, other parts of the world, including Canada and Australia, looking for this thing. And no one has come across the the original plans. There is a guy who I know has him, but, you know, a story goes, he... I'm not even going to bring him up and the reason why I can't acquire them. Um, anyway, one of the things I wanted to say is that there's a guy named Scott. Now, Scott showed up out of the blue and I connected with him about, I think, a month and a half ago. And this man worked in animation for almost 45 years. And he said to me, hey, Eddie, um, I got some stuff here and, you know, and... Well, to make a long story short, this man, out of the generosity of his heart, because, you know, he just wanted me, whatever. He says, Eddie, I'm going to do the plans for you. Uh, He took the the actual drawing of the picture of the ad itself, which, you know, kind of shows the display of the robot. And we looked at several ads uh, since 1971, I think, which was the first time it was ever sold by the J-Mar company. And he actually designed a robot, built a model, and actually made the plans for it from the model he built. And he made it look retro. In other words, he used wording and everything in the plans that would be for a kid growing up in the early 70s that would be able to actually put this together. And it is seven feet. I was so fascinated when he sent me the plans that I said, this is crazy. I worked a little bit on it, um, and I sent them away to the printers. And I printed it up because I said, people must have this. Now, in the yearning of all the years I've been looking for the robot plants, having this kind of settled within me, uh, where I feel that, well, I have not the originals, but something close to it, so therefore, I'm happy with it. I can wait to find the original now because I do have an alternative. Uh, Scott, not only that, Scott has been working on several projects for me so that I can take to Chiller. This man is phenomenal. He's one of the greatest artists in animation, actually, that I've ever met in my life. Um, As you guys know, I have very close friends, and each one is a legend in his own right. Like, for example, Richard Hilliard, who's worked with Creepshow and a lot of the television stuff, and, and he's done, he has worked that his paintings are, are fabulous. But he's painter. Now, what the difference is that with Scott, Scott can make pop-up books, 
Uh, he can make, you know, 3D cardboard models. He's not just an artist. He's an animator. So that's the only difference between the two of them. Now, um, I also have Kath Kavaraj. Kath Kavaraj, which has been doing, again, art for over 40 years, he's another great friend, and I've known him for over 25 years, and I'm proud to, in fact, I thank God that he's been in my life because Kath has actually drawn half the stuff that I've been using since I first met him, I guess, I think it was in the early 2000s. So, um, and again, Richard, me and Richard decided to do the project and revise the original haunting record, and I was going to have it ready for Chiller. But a lot of people don't realize that there's only like two major companies that actually print vinyl in the country, and there's a long wait. And I've been waiting, you know, to to get the the record, and as soon as I get it, it will be released to the public. Now, one thing I want to say, though, is... Today, I actually received the 7-foot robot plants. I cannot wait to take some photos of them and put them up. Because, I, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people on eBay are going to want them. I'm going to start them at a price of $19.95 because it is 18 by 24. It's glossy. They feel like they're kind of like on a plastic type of paper. It's plastic coated. Um... They cost me a lot of money to produce. It wasn't, I had to get a minimum of, you know, like 2000 And they're very hard uh, to do. And it was a special order, so there was a lot of cost involved. Um, to try to just, you know, make a little profit and get my money back, especially on eBay with the fees, because eBay's fees have skyrocketed since 2000. It, it's crazy. but And in fact, some of the re times I feel like just selling on Etsy, uh, because Etsy has a 5.9% you know, uh, auction uh, price at the end of the auction. And eBay can go anywhere from 5% to 15%, depending on what category you're selling under. Uh, which makes sometimes that impossible because eBay then also goes on to tell you that you know you have the credit card fee. So not only do they charge you a final auction fee, there's also the credit card fees. And then on top of the credit card fees, you have to pay for shipping. Now, one thing that I don't understand how eBay even did this, they implemented a new policy a few, a few years ago. And their policy was that, well, we're going to charge people uh a percentage of the final value price on the shipping cost. The funny thing about this is I understand if you're trying to prevent people from, say, for example, somebody selling something for $10 and then saying $35, $50 shipping. Uh, if you're trying to prevent people from doing that, I could see that. But where does the profits go? So in other words, you charge me 10% on the shipping fees. But why are you keeping the 10%? I'm not getting it to, to help me ship. The person's not getting it back. They, I still have to ship and pay whatever price it is. So not only do they have a final value fee on the price, they also charge you on the shipping fee. So that kind of, I don't understand. But anyway, the point is that if I've tried to get all my products listed on the website, and whatever the reason is, people on the website just don't purchase um, it's got like 3,500 hits in a month or two or three months it's been up. But they, I've, I think I've made like three sales on my website. And everybody purchases on a weekly basis from my eBay. They purchase from Etsy. And, and you know, and, and again, that's because I probably would have to spend thousands of dollars in advertising. Well, in eBay, you got to look at it this way. Okay, they do charge you a lot of money, but you're being seen by the world, you know. And the other thing is that you have to look at eBay is a is, um, good example is they have a new thing now that they let you, they kind of advertise for you, they promote, it's called promoted listings, and it can go from 1% to 20, whatever amount you put. But the problem with that, you have to realize is that promoted listing, they're going to charge you another fee on top of the final value fee. And sometimes you're not really making, like I had like, for example, recently a guy, I sell all my posters for 149 now, trust me, guys, when I tell you this, I'm making only about less than 30 bucks a poster. So when I sell it to somebody for, say, 130, it might be just me making like five, six dollars a poster. But you still have people that think they can offer me $95, 100. The posters, go to Staples if you try one and try to print a six foot full color poster on glossy stock, what they call, uh, you know, photo stock, and see what the cost is. It's going to. Uh, staples 
right now charges, I believe, $97 to print a poster. I get it through another printer that is a, a you know a printer that I've been using for years. It's a corporate printer in my area, and they give me 10% off. So basically, I am not making. And then the problem with this is they ship it directly from the, that warehouse. Because if I had them shipped to me, then I would have to pay shipping and it would be more costly. So they use FedEx or UPS and they're paying a premium price. Sometimes the shipping from here to California or from California to here is like $27.50. So, and I offer free shipping. I never tell anybody, okay, it's $149 plus $10 shipping. No. So you have to understand a lot of people out there. The reason I have the posters, and I'll go over this again, is House of the Unusual is a company that I started as a hobby back in 1985, okay? My idea back then was to own a mail-order company. In 1989, I met up Lou Weiss, and when I met with Lou Weiss, we reopened the original Fun Factory. Now, Lou Weiss, which he was on my podcast about four weeks ago, you can listen to the story there because it was a, it's a very good podcast. It's only it actually went an hour long because the conversation was really phenomenal and I just couldn't stop. But the thing I'm trying to say though is that with Lou Weiss, when we went back in and this is 1992, I believe it was, when we ran the full page ad in comics. At that time, there's no computers. People still actually look for books and magazines for ads, and they would send a money order or a check a money order. Sometimes they will send the actual money, and you had what's called a mail order business. I closed down my magic shop, and I was doing that with Lou. So it became the Fun Factory, because my original name when I started in 1985 was P&E House of the Unusual, or House of Unusual. It didn't have the the in it, the. And what happened... Is everybody I kept saying, I, I have a house on you, they would say house of the, and they put the die in automatically. So I figured the best way to approach this would be after Fun Factory. Uh, I changed the name of Fun Factory later on when I stayed on my own with the company. A uh, big mistake, I should have always stayed with Lou, but at the time I had to move to Florida or whatever, and you know. <laughs> but the, the point is, when I went on my own, I called it House of the Unusual so that people could. Basically, look it up better, and you know, I don't have to say house often usual, and they will say the no, and it was always a problem. Same thing when I tell any Hispanic person my name is Eddie, they automatically say Eric. So, if they want to call me Eric, let them call me Eric, but I always tell them Eddie, I'll even say Eduardo, and they'll still say Eric, <laughs> but that's life. So, um, the whole story, as I was saying about mail order and stuff, is that my idea was to always, always. Be able to give all my listeners, all my followers, everybody that purchased from me, bring them back in time and bring them back to when they were kids again. So it wasn't a thing. See, I have a, I had a regular job all the time. So I was making money. I didn't care if I made money in my mail order business or not. I just wanted to, you know, be able to sell the same products that when I was a kid, I was able to acquire in comic books, the x-ray glasses, the Venus flytrap, uh, all the fun stuff. Now, the great thing about that is today, my collection, I, I have one of all those things. And, and, you know, a lot of times people say, hey, how many of this do you have? Or how many of that? Well, the thing I'm trying to explain with that is that when I had my magic shop, I bought sometimes... 10 dozens, five dozens. And when I closed the shop, I kept all the products. So it, when people say, hey, Eddie, wow, you buy two of each or you buy three of each, it's not really that I buy two of each or three of each. It's that I had them from before. Um, say, for example, when the Adams Family Thing Box, um, Adams Family Movie came out, the one that they did uh, three movies, the modern one, not the original Adams Family, I sent away for the Thing Bank, the Thing Thing, thing Bank, was from Pointer Products, and what happened is that I bought them in you know wholesale cost, and I bought I think it was uh, seventy two pieces. I sold quite a few. I probably sold like forty of them. But you know what? I closed the shop by that time, and I have still like two boxes of Adams Family Thing Banks unopened. I also have I had five of the originals from the sixties because I did acquire over time. You know, whenever there was a good price, I buy it again and again and. Then one day there was a police officer that drove almost three hours to meet up with me, and and he had met uh, Laura, you know the the lady uh, who played uh, 
Wednesday Adams, Lori, uh, well, I know her first name, I think, Earring or Erin, whatever, and uh, the one that passed away recently. And he had met her, and I don't know what happened. He took a picture, whatever, and I think she grabbed his butt, whatever. So he came up, and it was so funny because he came up from South Jersey, and he drove almost three hours, I remember he told me, and I gave him three banks, and I think he gave me, if I remember, $225 for the three banks. So I only have three in stock, and then later on I bought like another two. Uh, so I do have five because I love the artwork in the box, and you know it, it is a good thing. The problem with those banks are though, anytime you see a pointed product bank, the original ones from the 60s, the gears were plastic, and if you just leave it alone without using it, you know it's it, the bank gets its own worst enemy. It dies on you. The gears break. And in eBay, there's a person that actually sells you the gears for like $15 where you can actually replace them. But, um, you know, that's why. And, and, and the funny thing is that I was looking for, uh, I guess it was, there's a bank that uh, Honor House used to sell in the late 60s, early 70s. And it was called the Haunted House Mystery Bank. Now, the bank said that a hand came out of the side. And then there's this other bank that's called the Haunted House Mystery Bank that has a ghost that comes out. And in the process, I've bought like maybe 16 of those <laughs> over time. And I usually, what I did is I, I, I bought like two or three in the beginning. And then I learned how to take them apart and, you know, fix them. And when I learned to do that, I actually would buy anything that was rusted or broken or it didn't work. I try to get it for under 100 and then I would sell it for like two or 300 bucks. Now, though... Uh, I, I still have like eight, and I have like six of them taken apart, which I haven't finished putting them back together, which is funny, though. Um, but I'm going to take my time and do it soon, I hope. I mean, it's it's so much that I want to do. And when you go into a storage unit, and then you... Now, I have I own three 10 by 15 storage units and two 5 by 10s And I can't hardly even walk into one of them. So they're all packed to the, to the rim. And... You know, I ask myself, my God, when am I ever going to be able to do something? So I'm kind of looking forward for June 22nd of this year because eBay said, I, I hope they keep the cost low, but they're going to allow for people to have live auctions, meaning I can actually be on YouTube or whatever it is or on eBay itself and actually transmit live as I sell my products. I think that's super cool. I know there's a lot of software to do that. I know a lot of people do it on Facebook. I mean, I don't know how. I haven't I haven't really tried it, so I'm not going to dabble into it just yet cuz right now I was concentrating in, in you know, publishing a couple of the books that I've had in in my mind of doing for years and and right now I'm actually working on three more titles because this one particular book which is the one I was trying to re uh, write before Kirk Demaris actually wrote Mail Order Mysteries, which come, you know has my entire collection in there. But I wanted to write the book before Kirk, but because of lack of money and stuff, I couldn't do it. So finally, I'm actually working on that book, but that's going to be like a 250-page project. So, you know, that's going to take a little while before I release it. I do have the front cover for it already. Um, and the front cover was actually done by... Uh, by Calf Cavarage and, and and there's Vasco is the guy who colorized it and stuff. There, these people have worked with comic books. They've published their own comics and they've been doing, uh, you know, art for for over 40, 50 years. Uh, Cav is not a young guy, you know. And one of the things I'm going to say though is that the cover came out phenomenal. It's a perfect cover. It's called the Seven Foot Monster that Never Was and. Basically, it's the untold stories of those famous mail order comic book ads. But the story is that the book is 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 a good read. Uh, it starts with has pictures of the product, has a little history of the product, and then it has what you actually got, and then it has testimonials from different people. That's why the book is taking so long to publish. So people will say, "Hey, you know, this is what I bought. I expected this. The Polaris sub." It's going to be a fun read, so that's why I'm going to make that my my baby project, my my biggest project of all. Um, so the other thing I was going to say is I do have right now five books on queue. They have been with the assistance of Chuck and his wife. The first book is called Skull Magic Unleash, which is available on Amazon. It's a DIY, do it yourself. It shows you how to build a couple of the projects, and it also has a little history and background on skull magic and, and the different magicians that used it throughout the ages. 
Then the second book, which so far has been one of the best sellings we, we have, is How to Hunt with Magic. Now, this one has about 15 or 20 projects. I forgot the exact amount. And the whole book is a do-it-yourself from front to back. And the book is phenomenal. And actually, they um, contacted me recently from San Diego where there's going to be a, con a book con. And there's a company that actually wants to have the book there. I said, no problem. I okayed that. Um, so that's something that I'm looking to. And then the third book that I published is going to be concerning the Betts Ball, which is the alien ball from space that I uh, actually have the book written because I'm going to bring the ball to Chiller. So I want to have the book so people can see what type of experiments my company paid uh, to try to see if this is the original Betts Ball or not. I'm not going to tell you what it is because then it would defeat the purpose of the book, right? Then the other two books I published were the, the fourth book is called The Shadows of Time, The Chrono Shadow Initiative. And it's concerning a clandestine operation, which is called the Chrono Shadow, Shadow Initiative, that actually might have been behind many of life's famous... Uh, uh, you know, UFO theories and hoax and, and, I mean, all this stuff. I mean, it takes on the Philadelphia experiment, which is the Montauk. It has the Roswell, the other Roswell. It ha it, it ties in the Kettsburg incident from Pennsylvania with, um, I mean, all the conspiracy theories you heard is is on this book. It, ta it talks about the lizard people. It talks about the, um, let me see if I remember some of the other things. And then what it does it actually takes the Ketzberg incident towards chapter 5 and combines it with the Nazi bell and tries to interwind, see if there's any anything be to connection between the two. The book is phenomenal. It's 165 or 68 pages. It's a fun read. But one thing I'm going to tell you right now, each chapter, I mean, the last chapter itself, the last two chapters, will break things, which sometimes looks like it's repeating stuff, but it's not. It's actually analyzing each and every detail to a T. So to, so as to pl explain, you know, uh, I had the help of uh, two scientists. One is an, a German guy and another one is the same guy who uh, helped me. The, the other guy holds two PhDs, one in electrical engineering, computer science, and he does all sorts of research and all to UFOs and stuff for a lot of the companies use them. Now, both individuals helped me put this book. Now, this book is phenomenal. The final book that came out about a month ago, which this book has so far done, I think, a little better in the beginning than the rest of the books, and that's because it's called The Entertainer's Wife. It's the story of, of uh, Sherry. Now, she wrote this book. She would send me, and I put together the book for her, and she would send me all her stories, and I, you know, I would put them up with the original pictures and stuff, and... It's all her story of being with Chuck as a magician uh, 30 years at his side. Now, Chuck's been doing magic for over 40, but he's been married to Sherry, I believe, almost 31, 32 years. And this book showcases her story, her life with him on the road. It's a fun read. It's a good book. And what Chuck has done is when he does magic shows, of course, at the end of the show, he's been promoting the book. So the book has been, <laughs> he's been uh, selling quite a few, which I was shocked. They sold almost 40 the first night the book came in printing. And I was shocked about that. I was like, are you kidding? And uh, anyway, that book is phenomenal. So if you guys want to see any of those books, and you, I do appreciate it, though, because a lot of guys are buying the book and some people are not putting in reviews. And I've asked them, and they go, oh, I forgot. <laughs> The thing is that it's important for the reviews because it helps our, the algorithm in Amazon for us. So the idea is for you guys to do a review. And if you do a review, please post it. Um, I'll be more than happy if you write to me and say, Hey, Eddie, and I'll even probably send you a free gift. If you, I need reviews, guys. I need the reviews. Uh, we haven't enough reviews in the first book, but uh, the last couple of books have, you know, because and, and I, I can see they've sold. I've gotten, you know, paid for it. They've sold. The books have sold. But people buy them and then, you know, they just never go back and put a review. So I would appreciate it if you guys do it. Now, the books can be found on Amazon. All you have to do is look up either Chuck Caputo, Eddie Guevara, and it'll pop up. You'll see the five books there. Um, now, guys, uh, having said that, I, I want to thank you guys for listening. I want to thank you guys for tuning in each and every week. And uh, Chuck... If you're there, buddy, go ahead, you and your wife. Thank you, guys.
Okay, thanks, Eddie. Hey, we're back. It's great to be back. I'm with my wonderful wife, Sherry. Hello. <laughs> we, <laughs> we took a little bit of time off. Uh, we, we were very busy with our grandson. Oh, my goodness, I was doing shows all the time. And I think we had a little bit of an illness, didn't we? Didn't yeah, we? we had that horrible stomach virus. For Chuck and I, it lasted about over a week, which was not fun. But we're back. We're all healthy now, praise the Lord. Yeah, and uh, so, uh, yeah, that was about a week of uh, a terrible time, and we're trying to function as human beings, and it was, uh, it was not easy. So tell us, what's our topic today? Well, I'll be glad to tell you, Sherry, this is some cool facts about birds. Now, I guarantee Ooh. you're going to, the uh, the listening audience out here, you're going to hear things about birds that you never knew. Some very, very interesting facts. I'm excited about this, Sherry. All right, sounds good to me. All right. So All right, let me start out. One of my favorite birds, penguins. They're the only bird that can swim but cannot fly. And they're the only bird that walks upright. They're so darn cute. They yeah. look like they have a tuxedo on. Oh, they're so cute. We've seen them at the zoo here in oh, Pittsburgh many yes. times. And so they're, cute. They're in that cooler. They have them like on a refri- in a refrigerated <laughs> type of a uh, like an atmosphere. You can yeah. touch the glass or the Lexan. It's so cold. And it's amazing how cold it is. They like to go up the ramp. And go down there. And they slide. They have fun. They they like to play with each other. Fascinating creatures. Cute. Okay, an owl. Owls turn their head 360 degrees, which I'm sure you knew, mm-hmm. but they cannot move their eyes. Isn't that amazing? So they just spin their head around to see what's going on. Yeah, Behind wow. them, they can't. That's amazing. That's wild. Now, chickens have over 200 distinctive noises they make for communicating with each other. That's a lot. I just always thought they just went... Quack, 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 quack. <laughs> yeah, I did not, quack, quack, I did not, I did not know that. That's a complex. That is something interesting. Very complex. Hmm. Males and birds have the most colorful feathers. Ooh. So uh, I guess that's with peacocks. And what did you say, cardinals? And... Oh, yeah. You could tell with the robins which one's the male. They're the colorful ones. There you go. That's All true. Right. Um, the first bird that was domesticated, would, could you guess, by a human? It was a goose. I had no idea. I think that was Mother Goose that uh, <laughs> domesticated the goose. I don't know. I know. Uh, years ago, when I was a kid, even people would eat goose for uh, for Christmas. That was, yeah? a, that was a Christmas goose. That's true. Yeah. That's pretty wild. Now, I'm not sure about this bird, what this is even, but kiwi birds are blind, and they hunt by smell. Huh. Uh, I, I know what a kiwi fruit is. I'm not yes. sure about a kiwi bird. But never, never really heard about this. But there you this. go. It's interesting. To find out where they're from. Now, some breeds of chickens can lay colorful eggs, not just the brown ones, but also like green or blue. Mm. How unique is that? Yeah, and it's that, just certain breeds that do that. Yeah, that would flip me out. I know. Wow. <laughs> it was rough getting used to eating brown eggs. Yeah, huh? <laughs> we had to get over that, man. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. But anyway, a common phrase is eat like a bird. This, yes, I've heard that. Yes, this makes no sense because uh-huh. basically birds eat twice their weight in food per day. That's a lot of food. That's a lot of food. Woo. Now, here's interesting about mockingbirds. They can imitate any sound. And that's from like a squeaking door to a cat's meow. That's amazing. Yeah, I did not know that. I guess that's where they get the name from, mockingbird. Wow, right. Wow, that's something. Yeah. And also, some birds communicate with color and sound. While they also have non-vocal methods, such as beating their wings in the air that's to establish their territory. Yeah, I like to flap my arms in the air to, uh, to show that this place is mine around here. <laughs> Male blackbirds puff up their feathers to show off their colorful shoulders. Ooh. And this is how a female chooses them based on this factor. I didn't know they had colorful uh, shoulders. Wow. I didn't either. So <laughs> whoever's the best looking, that's what the ones they want. That's it. Now, these are, this is some interesting facts. Um, a group of larks is called an exclamation. Wow, I think that's exaltation. Yes, it is. Exaltation, <laughs> right, sorry. Okay. That's okay. A group of chickens is called a peep. Huh. A group of geese is called a gaggle. All right, and ooh, a group of ravens is called a murder. Murder. Now, that's my favorite. <laughs> All right. Now, speaking of ravens, they're one of the most smartest birds, uh, them and the crows Yes. Um, on Earth. Uh, crows have the largest brains relative to the body size. And the oldest raven was about 22, almost 23 years old. It was raised in captivity, um, which 
if they're raised in captivity, they can actually imitate human words. Yeah, it doesn't surprise me. I've, I've read a lot about these things. Uh, Ravens, one yeah. example of their intelligence is uh, there's a video. I don't know where I've seen it, but it wasn't too long ago. Huh. It, was, it was raining out. Uh, the rainwater was filling up a clear tube. It didn't have a top, but it had a bottom. Okay. I think it was an experiment somebody put out. Oh. Anyway, the tube was filled about halfway with water with uh, rainwater, uh, the raven walked over, he sauntered over, he put his beak inside, he couldn't reach the water. Yeah. So he went over one by one and dropped, uh, picked up a pebble, dropped it inside until oh. the water level raised high oh. enough so he could drink it. Look at that, now how that's, smart. that's intelligence. I don't know if I'd be able to remember No, I don't think do I'd know to do that. <laughs> I, I would, I'd just be parched. <laughs> Dehydrated. <laughs> and crows are also very intelligent. They mate for life, they remember faces, and they hold a grudge. Well, Who would a, figure that? You know what? That sounds like my family. They hold, they hold <laughs> grudges all the time. <laughs> oh, get a load of this. They hold funerals for the deceased. That's why. So they have little pallbearers. I guess they do. Uh, like a little hearse. Wow. Mm. <laughs> I know they make tools, and they also hide their food. Yeah, that's amazing. And they yeah. are, there's even white ravens. I did not know that. Yeah, that's some uh, kind be, of genetic. Yeah, because yeah. we always think of the black ones, uh, which are beautiful. They're absolutely gorgeous. Uh, let's see here. And they both can even set up other animals for defeat. Yeah, I was surprised. They can be spiteful, I actually read, where they could like put food on the train tracks when an animal comes over. Like if they don't like them, they'll get hit by the train. Dirty birdies. Yeah, it's unbelievable. Yeah. But we have a few uh, minutes left here. Oh, sounds good. And uh, did you do something recently? <gasps> yeah. Did you know I wrote a book? I didn't know that, Sherry. <laughs> <laughs> I actually collaborated with my wonderful husband, Chuck, here, and Eddie Gravera from House of the Unusual, my good friend. The three of us wrote a book, and it is called, what's it called, Chuck? The Entertainer's Wife. Yes, and what is it all about? Well, I'll tell you what. She's been married to a a nut like me (laughs) for uh, 32 years almost, and we were dating for two years before that, so 34 years she's known me. Lovely. And she's been coming on magic shows with me for... All the, for the pretty much time. 34 years. <laughs> yeah. We've experienced some things that you would not believe. Some crazy stories. Yeah, so this is 95 pages jammed uh, with funny stories, anecdotes, and so forth. Beautiful and, color pictures. Yeah, the pictures. Eddie did a wonderful job on the pictures Yeah, the pictures and are editing. great. We, we picked out different pictures, and we sent them down to Eddie, and he put them in there. Everything point. And uh, I tell you what, it's a great book. I I can't stop looking at it. I mean, uh, the cover is absolutely phenomenal. Uh, And the table of contents, oh, you look very beautiful, Sherry. Oh, well, thank you, honey. Yeah. so you're so silly. You know what? And the book is available. Go ahead, Sherry. Yeah, it's soft book, soft cover, but it's a nice size. Easy read, fun reading. Um, And also, it's on Kindle. It's found on Amazon. And I believe they're going to be bringing out the hardcover soon. Right now, that'll be available. If you do have a problem finding the book, once you go to Amazon, search uh, Chuck Caputo or Eddie Gravera, and it'll hit. It'll go, drop down a box. It'll show you all the available books, and there's and there's other books that we've written that are fantastic. We deal with the unusual. I mean, uh, there's uh, there's a book on UFOs. There's uh, 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 books on the Betts sphere, the Betts ball. I mean, we deal with things. House of the unusual. But, yes. And if you'd be so kind, please give us a review on Amazon, a good review. Give us five stars. And anybody that does uh, buy any of those books, uh, we'd be happy to um, send a signature plate, an author's uh, signed uh, yes. plate. Yes, if you, if you would like a book plate, yes. you know what, contact me through Eddie or what have you, and I'll have yes. Sherry and she'll sign it. And if you want, I can sign it too, and well, we can yes. mail it to you because we can't ship the book back and forth. It's just... It would, it, would, right. it would be ridiculous. Yes. Uh, and Amazon are, takes care of all the shipping. Right. So. But anyway, thank you so much. And we look forward to talking to you folks again. We thank you so much for tuning in. And um, God bless. God bless. Take care. Bye-bye.